I'm here at Rising Star today with David Wiggins, the breeding master, kind of like uh, the master. That's right, the master, the master breeder, that's what he is. And we're going to show you several things. Uh going to show you the preparation for uh, breeding, what has to take place, and then actually breeding procedures, the shipping, the whole nine yards of being a breed master at Rising Star. So, David, what's it like being in the position that you're in? Oh, it ain't as glamorous as it looks, Jerry. <laughs> I'll just tell you, uh, and I don't know how long the interview is, you know, I get a little wordy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I kind of, Steve Beach was always a mentor of mine when I started doing this. And uh, there was many times, you know, when Steve and him do it, Steve be driving Cadillacs everywhere. When he was my age at the time, he'd be mm. buying two-year-old World Grand Champions. Uh, and when I got to doing it one day, I was with Steve, he was, you know, showing me to check some mares and stuff. And I said, man, this stuff ain't as glamorous as y'all made it look. And he just laughed. <laughs> well, he that's, does what, that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's, 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 supposed to be it's, it, it's not as glamorous as it looks, you know. Uh, but it, it's something we enjoy doing. We enjoy the people. Uh, this time of year, when the baby colts hit the ground, is probably our favorite time of year because uh, we get to see the, the product of our efforts. Today we got a call. It's early in our season, and uh, we're collecting Genomite who is the 2018 World Grand Champion. 852, Jen Amighty. To your right, please, Jimmy McConnell. Riding under the celebration spotlight tonight, Jimmy McConnell and Jen Amighty. They claim the World Grand Championship title for 2018 for owner Mike Floyd of Columbia. Jimmy McConnell and Jen Amighty. 2018 World Grand Champion. Ladies and gentlemen, that honor and that ride tonight belongs to Jen Amighty and Jimmy McConnell. Jen Amighty, owned by Mike Floyd of Columbia, ridden and trained by Jimmy McConnell. It's Jen Amighty. Ladies and gentlemen, send your world grand champion out with a great round of applause. We haven't collected him since last fall. He knows, he knows where he is. He let us know that uh, he was ready, so we're going to get ready for him. We usually collect him with a Missouri AV, but there's two different types of AVs that we usually use. You have the Missouri right there. That's a Missouri bladder. And this is a Colorado AV developed out in Colorado State. We have some that like this type, we have some that like this type. Jen Mighty likes the Missouri type, so that's the kind we use on him. So this bladder will fill with some warm water to basically replicate a mare as best as possible. Some of these studs, it doesn't take a whole lot to fool them, and some it takes a lot more to fool them. So right now, the water that we're putting in here is all about 50 to 53 centigrade. We want it warm enough, but just not too hot. It creates warmth, it creates pressure, gives us the result we need. Like filling up an old bicycle inner tube. The cap here is like a bicycle inner tube collection bottle to the end here. That's all good and secure. And we'll put a cover on it so we can hold it.
every horse is different. Every horse is a different size. We're gonna put a little lubricant in here and then we're gonna adjust the pressure so we know that it's not too tight. prepared so now we've collected our sample and we'll see the quality of it and how many mares can be bred from it so he gave me about a hundred and fifteen cc's that will give us a sample Basically, we're just dipping into our, our sampling cup here. It's already extended. And what you're going to see here, and I'll make this bigger, you can see all the cells moving. So basically, we'll hit the button. It'll analyze it. It's going to tell us kind of it's showing that we got 82% motility. And what's neat about this device here, I can record it uh, and it'll save all that later on if somebody wanted to you know, check a sample out. So let me use his initials here, GAM. And we'll package it up. So let me do a little calculator here. So one to one, he gave me a hundred and basically 15 cc's. Uh, we're gonna ship a billion sperm cells per dose. That's kind of the standard shipping dose is a billion. So According to our device here, we can ship 20 doses. We want to make sure that we're sending a dose that's going to have the longest longevity, uh, and that's what we'll, uh, we'll do here. Uh, let me get a couple of syringes, and we'll make a dose up. We've already extended out as designated by our equipment. We've labeled it. They've got two good doses. There's a billion modal sperm in each dose because that's kind of the standard shipping dose on shipping. Uh, the reason we sent a billion is because the standard of, you know, the guidelines is that you want 500 million, you know, modal sperm cells. Well, the industry standard, you ship a billion and, you know, you may get an overnight kill of 50%. That way you still have 500 million to easily get the mare, mare pregnant. We're going to pack it in here. And this is just kind of an industry disposable box that we see in. A little ice brick on top, like you're shipping a six pack. We close it up. This shipment today is going to Louisville, Tennessee. It's in East Tennessee. And there you have it. That is ready to go. Somebody's going to have a February baby. And uh, I guess my other most favorite time is, you know, when you start seeing the two-year-olds in the ring, you know, the baby colts that we've seen come along, how they've progressed and who's become stars and in the show ring and who've just become family stars. Uh, but, uh, you know, we deal with right now around 20, 21 stallions here. Uh, we've stood many world champions over the years. Uh, and every one of them's different from personality wise to size wise to what they like to what they don't like uh, You know people always ask me says how come you got this horse next to this horse? It's no different than running kindergarten. You got to put the child next to the child that they're gonna be quiet all the time mm -hmm. if my, my main job is make sure they're quiet and happy 
they're quiet and happy, they do the rest of the job perfectly. Well, it's uh, about like it is in a, in a regular training barn. True. Because I'll watch Jerry, he will move them horses around to where they act better. Yeah. Kind of like us, they, they keep us separated. Yeah, some people you don't want to eat lunch with. <laughs> That's right. There's some some people you want to other table. No, but uh, it's developed over time. And one thing we have access to nowadays when it comes to, let's say, planning a breeding is our technology is catching up. Right. Whereas I'll look at the thoroughbred industry and I'll just tell you, nobody does it like the thoroughbred industry. There's more information available when it comes to certain, I mean, really all horses. Uh, and let's say bloodline matches, you know, who's doing well in the ring, who's not. We're just scratching the surface of what they can do. But with the implementation of iPads a few years ago, where we can all easily bring up a pedigree, uh, with all the show results being easily obtained and looking online, with breeding records attached to the horses on the show results, we can come up with percentages and determine, you know, what crosses are doing well, you know, why certain mares cross well with certain stallions, and, uh, you know, that helps us better the breed. You know, the, the breeder of Tennessee walking horses nowadays, we have more information available than we ever had. You know, before it was, you know, everybody said flip a coin, you know, or breed to what SW's got. You either breed to what SW's got, what Vic had, or what Harlandsdale had. Uh, nowadays, there's some stallions I'll reach out there and grab because I love their pedigree. Right. You know, they may not have been the most famous stallion in the ring, but you can tell they have what it takes to be a breeding horse. Well, some of our great breeding horses never even showed the celebration. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, a lot of people don't realize that, but it's true. And, but, you know, we're, we're always looking. We've got uh, a couple of new ones added to our lineup this year. Uh, one is the Memphis Blues, which he's a son of Elvis Pusher. Uh, Elvis Pusher only had 12 foals. And like three of them won the celebration, two of them won a set of roses. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he and, and his mother also produced foals from Prison Blues. And granted, this horse here showed in the show pleasure class, uh, has the ability, has the looks, but the strength of it is the family the pedigree uh, and we try to expand you know on the pedigree when we see a pedigree that regularly produces at a higher rate successful individuals that gets our attention you know so uh, we're, we're excited about that horse and another new horse is the uh, the uh, El Nino son the Nino's category five which he himself is out of his full sister to a strong dollar which a strong dollar was one of our favorites here oh yeah you know losing over time, losing Strong Dollar and really losing his father, which his father aged out. His father made a big impact. Strong Dollar left before, you know, he could make the full impact that he could make. And then, you know, unfortunately, the, the recent loss of his two, you know, two of his greater sons in Vita Blue and Strong Need for Cash, uh, which we don't, you know, we're about to lose that bloodline which I'm excited about El Nino's Category 5 because I still have that bloodline on the bottom side of his pedigree with him being out of the, uh, the only full sister to a strong dollar. Right. You know, David, through the years, I know a lot of people that they talk about used to, they'd have 15 mares, they'd, they'd breed all 15 mares in hopes of getting that one. Sure. Now, they're more selective because I can oh, yeah. hear... I, at breakfast, I will hear him talking about breeding this mare with this stud mm -hmm. and getting those bloodlines to where they match. And mm -hmm. they say, well, that one's got a strong back end, but I, I really want a, a big front end, too. Mm -hmm. And they will do that. So some of the mixes, and I know you and I talked a few minutes ago about the armed, uh, armed and dangerous mm -hmm. bloodlines mm -hmm. mixing. And then the... Ritz, putting on the Ritz, I mean, one of the greats. Mm -hmm. But go through some of the good bloodlines that, that you can cross. Well, you know, one of the, I guess, most successful crosses in the show ring, you know, uh, uh, that you see more in the show ring is Jose on a generator mare. Now, granted, Jose's 20, 
four this year. Uh, and the youngest generator mare is going to be 19. Uh, so that's going to fade away. Right. You know, they, we, they only live so long. You know, we, we wish some of them would live forever, but they're not going to be here in a few years. Uh, that, that's probably one of the, the greater crosses. Uh, and granted, I'm quoting stuff I deal with regularly. You know, Lima Cash uh, uh, you know, or Hard Cash Mares bred to Rips, that was always a good cross. Uh, Lima Cash bred on, on Ritz Mares uh, is always good a cross. Um, speaking of Armed and Dangerous, you know, we have Deal For Real here. Right. And what I like about Deal For Real, he's not really like a generator horse. He's like an Ebony Masterpiece horse, which his sire, uh, you know, Armed and Dangerous was out of an Ebony Mare, then Deal himself was out of an Ebony Mare. So you've got a strong Ebony Masterpiece line. That's why you see from his colts more of that old, true walking gait, more size, more bone mass. Uh, not a lot of, you know, pride on pride on pride, which gives us an aesthetically pleasing looking horse. You get too much of that, you, you lose bone mass, you lose durability. Uh, and you and I both know, I don't know of any horses that really work as hard as a Tennessee walking horse. You know, race horses, they run, what, two minutes? Mm -hmm. You know, flat out, Tennessee walking horses, I mean, they're in there at a good steady grind doing the gear they do for at least 15, 20 minutes. That's fact. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, they probably, you know, you know do more in the ring than any other breed of horse when you're exhibiting them anywhere else. Now granted you have these pulling competitions and those horses exert a lot of energy, but it's over a very brief time. You know, snap a finger and it's done. You know what you just said, and this, this is about the durability. Mm -hmm. We did two coats. There'll be fall coats. One of them was a stud, one of them was a fill. Mm -hmm. And of course we had to get them down because they, they were both deals, a deal stud and a deal filly. Mm -hmm. And we know that they like to trot a little bit mm -hmm. and then they break into the walk. Yeah. But we spent quite a bit of time out there trying to just get them to slow down enough that mm -hmm. they would go to walking. Mm -hmm. and, and that was one of the things that we were talking about. The, the I guess you got the motor they've got yeah. that they kind of go in. I, I see well, that a lot. Most of the deals, because we're familiar with a lot of the deals around here. You know, we got deal and we've raised uh, most of the colts buying here. Uh, they're a lot like those ebony horses. They try until you get to work in minor ordeal. One of the greatest show horses living today tried it when he was young. That's right. You know, I mean, uh, you know, the pride bred horses have a little more gait, a little more swing to them. You get you get outside of that. I mean, pushers, for example, when pushers were big, you didn't want a pusher that swung. If he didn't trot, it scared you to death. Because our experience with them is, is those who, let's say at Liberty, were to trot, that was their natural gait before you put a bit in their mouth and went to work. Uh, they would gear up just perfect. Right. Whereas one that, let's say, paced too much, you can never get him back in the gear. Uh, you know, you just kind of got to know the product you had. Now, hard cash is on the opposite side. Right. If a hard cash tried it, he's in trouble. You know, they needed to swing. You know, uh, all the Colt guys know that, and they know that from experience of dealing with them. We knew that because we go out and buy and trade and sell yearlings. So the individual has to look great. The gate, according to what's successful with their pedigree, has to look great as well. Uh, and granted all the information that we have uh, access to, and there's a lot of it that it's just not I have access to, anybody that's breeding has access to. You know, they can go to the Walking Horse Report and pull up records. They can go to iPads and you know, pull up records. Uh, and they can see videos, most of them on Water Horse, uh, uh, which, which that accounts for a lot as well. But uh, just having the data to make your breeding decisions Get you closer to where you need to be. It, most people say, "Oh, it's just a crap shoot, you know, roll the dice." If that's your attitude going into it, that's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get crap. Okay, uh, you just got to 
educate yourself. Uh, hell, me, other people at different breeding farms, we're more than glad to give you our advice. Our advice is free, uh, but we'll be more than glad to help people you know, make breeding decisions where they're successful. We want to be successful. They're not successful. They're not going to do it for very long. They don't do it very long. Yeah, they don't do it for very long. We don't stay in business very long. That's so it. So our job is to help people be successful. Well, here, here's one other thing. This is a conversation that a lot of people have had. I really love my mare. Mm -hmm. and, and I think she, she's produced some good foals. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, if you want to start and you want to breed, Get you a good mare first, mm -hmm. then go look for that stud to match with that mare, mm -hmm. because that colt's going to be with that mare a whole lot longer. Now this is just my yeah. Ranking. You want you know we we deal with mares of all type around here. Um, you know, granted the the more popular bloodlines, uh, 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 the more productive bloodlines that people know of. When you go to selling a colt. There's not a lot of guesswork. When somebody comes by, they see, let's say it's out of a, let's say a generator or a Jose mare or a Skywatch mare uh, or a Jasmine mare, things like that. They don't think twice. Pusher mares. Pusher mares, of course. Pusher mares are great. Uh, they're like generators. They're aged out, though. It's hard to find a young pusher mare. Uh, but, you know, a lot of our job is to find, you know, what is the next generation of good producing mares. You know, there's some stallions that don't produce great studs, produce wonderful mares. Right. I mean, to me, Delight of Pride was one of those stallions. Delight of Pride mares were wonderful. We love Delight of Pride mares. Uh, but it's just following the trends and what people are successful with and what they're successful with, whether they show strictly a flat shot horse, you know, or, or, or a padded horse. Um, but the common factor in those, people say, well, do you breed a certain way for flat shot or a certain way for padded? I go, no. It's all the same. I breed for a balanced horse. You know, if a horse is too long, I try to make him shorter. If a horse is too small, I try to make him bigger. Uh, we try to breed for balance. In my head, I don't have it written down. There's a certain individual I have in my head all the time. And we see the attributes of, let's say, the mare side, attributes of the, the sire side. And one thing, you don't always go by the individual standing in front of you. If you have, let's say, a, a, a mare in front of you that you know paces all the time but comes from a trotty background, I still breed her according to pedigree. I'm more right than wrong when I do that. Um, you gotta trust your gut. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 and you're we're, we're, we're wrong a lot. <laughs> we're wrong a lot. Hey, hey, you know the way I look at that? Yeah. A good hitter in baseball is one that can hit 300. Oh, yeah. That means he's only hitting the ball three out of every 10 times. Yeah. So, I mean, that, and, but that's considered great. And, and that's what you've got to look at like this. Mm -hmm. is Because if you'll have some great horses that are great twos, threes, and then they don't produce no further. And we, we have studs like it. We have studs that'll produce greater young horses. We have studs that'll produce greater older horses. Well, I noticed that through the years, you will see some horses that are not do real well as a two-year-old, mm -hmm. get better as a three-year-old, mm -hmm. better as a four-year-old, and then better at a five and on up. Yeah. Pusher, what was he, 12? Mm -hmm. When he won the World Grand Championship? Mm -hmm. And I believe... Uh, uh, Sammy Day on Mountain Man. Mountain Man, was Mountain old, Man. He was older. Hey, older. So th these are things that mm -hmm. that people who love the industry mm -hmm. and they love to show. I love to see someone come out see, of the ring with a fourth place ribbon with a smile on their face. Here's what's different now. Our best studs don't end up in the big state. That's, that's the size. Okay. Of our best studs, back in the day, our best studs ended up in the big state. I see some of our greater studs in the show pleasure class, some of the greater studs in the amateur specialty class. Uh, uh, that's where I see them. You know, four-year-old amateur class. I mean, there's a lot of horses that win those that could easily go win the big stake. Right. Okay. Now, granted, I love what's come out of the big stake lately, but you, if you look at it from top to bottom, you know, 
in the past, the quality would be pretty consistent from, let's say, first to tenth. Uh, well, a lot of the greater horses are winning the show pleasure stake or winning, yeah. winning the amateur specialty stake or, or winning the open specialty stake. Uh, a lot of people don't canter anymore. I know. A lot of these horses don't ever get a chance to canter, so they never get to what we have always called our ultimate title. Now, as a breeder, I got to get beyond title. I got to look at horse. Right. See what the horse is doing. Look, look at this. We've got. We had. I know of two great breeding studs that never showed past their three-year-old year. year. Mm-hmm. Jose and Skywatch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those were two that went into the breeding barn. Oh yeah. And one of them was when Waterfall was still around, Joe Mart. And there's a, another great one, never won a world title, Jasmine. That's it, Jasmine, you're yeah. correct. Yeah. Well, Pride, he never mm-hmm. showed celebration. Mm-hmm. So now, Lion, Lion Cash never won a world championship. Yep. People always ask me why. I said, because he's the same age as Jose. <laughs> That's it. He competed against Jose. <laughs> hey, said he it. won the fraternity, I said, but when he showed against Jose, you Jose beat be. him. Right. So, I mean, it's all, the people who love the horse are going to breed, yep. they're going to show, they're going to enjoy the horse, they're mm-hmm. going to have a good time. I love the Tennessee walking horse because it's always, it's a family horse. Well, it's true. Family. You know, and I, I'm spending a lot of time talking about the show horse part of it. I have as much fun as that family come in here, they bring their favorite mare and want to breed to something, let's say like Cool Allen Jackson, they want to get them a buckskin and white coat to enjoy at home. That's we right. have just as much fun with them raising that foal as raising the next big stake winner. Well, look how many people go to the horse shows Yeah, that like to trail ride. Right mm-hmm. here, right here at Rising Star, Debbie Eichler saddles them up and rides around the farm oh, yeah. just because she likes to ride. Yeah, And that that's a lot, David, a lot. Oh, she loves her horses Going now. To, brought my grandson over this weekend. Mm-hmm. We're going to show him a little bit later on a horse. Mm-hmm. He goes home. You know what he tells his mother and daddy? What? That Jerry Beatty and Mike get to play with horses all day long. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to him. That's kind of like me. People go, you're around horses all the time. Do you ride all the time? I don't ride at all. <laughs> you don't ever ride. I don't ever get to ride. Life. I'm taking care of everything else. That's the beauty of the horse, though. Yeah. Everybody loves it. Oh, yeah. David, I appreciate the time you spend with us. Man, I always have, I always have a pleasure talking time. to you all about horses now. As long as we talk about horses, we're having a good time. Right? Well, like I said, we want everybody to have a, a, a great foaling season with no problems and beautiful babies. And uh, give us a call or any other our local breeding farms. And it kicks off March March 1st, 1st kind of our official kickoff date. Right. But as you all saw, we're shipping today. Sure and we've read a few already. It's kind of like our mares can't read a calendar. Right. You know, if I tell people, if you've got a mare ready and our stud's ready, we're ready. We're ready. Yep. And I'm going to tell you, Jenna Mighty was ready today. He was. All right. We love him now. Thank you. We, we, we think he's got a big future. Oh, from the size of him, I felt that neck one time. He, he's got a neck on him. Oh, yeah. He, he's a beautiful horse. He's a beautiful horse.